Bath is known worldwide for its summer arts festival, but few visitors to the brightly coloured little fishing port are aware of its dark and shameful past. David I of Scotland granted the lands of Pitt and Ween to the Priory of May in 1318. Before the abbey was built, the borough was likely to have been a hamlet of only a few fishermen's huts. Remains of the abbey suggest that it was once a place of considerable size and beauty, with a church, refectory, convent and a prior's hall connected to a subterranean passage that still exists. This passage cut out of rock runs down to a small cell known as St Dylan's Cave. It's named after The spring that flows through the inner chamber is believed to have healing powers. The monks and friars that came to Pitt and Ween resisted any attempt at control by the archbishops, and one monk believed he was a law unto himself. A beautiful girl called Betsy Smith was one of several young women who disappeared from the village. Betsy met this monk while on an errand for her father, and the friendly monk invited her into the abbey's grounds. Betsy felt it would be rude to refuse. Once inside, he tried to rape her, but Betsy fought back, and he carried her down the subterranean tunnel and locked her in St. Dylan's cave. Betsy screamed until she was hoarse, but two heavy doors prevented her both from escape and her screams being heard by the family, searching frantically for her outside. St. Dylan's cave, together with the town council and the Church of Scotland, would again play a part in Pitt and Ween's appalling social history. In 1593, King James VI confirmed the charters granted to the town council, baileys, burgesses and the monastery of Pitt and Ween. Also the charters for the building of a toll booth, prison, warehouse and a grammar school. How could the king have known that just a hundred years later, the council charged with the education of the young would instead cultivate the ignorance and superstition that would result in the death of schools of own people. He could not possibly name his tormentor and scrutinize at them to stop the pain. Patrick Cooper noticed the similarities to the Bargarian deception. He didn't mention it, nor did anybody simply have foretold that I seemed to notice the paradox of a witch ordering called Eye of Nail the very metal that had the power to seal off its teeth to the devil. Cooper took control of the situation and brought Beatrix Lang in front of the councillors. She was imprisoned in the toll booth and with a week after a week of witch pictures working on her, she confessed to being a witch and named 15 other witches in the town. Beatrix then spent three months in the teeth hole a pitch black windowless cell in St. Helen's cave. She was without any human contact. One of the names was Thomas Brown, a man in his seventies who, even after two months of abominable torture, would not confess. The elderly man was deprived of speech and forced to walk in circles round his small filthy cell. When he was tired, he was driven forward by one of his guards. He hit him with a witch goat, a wooden paddle-shaped instrument with inch-long pins embedded in the flat end. His body could take no more, and he died at the beginning of June 1704. The prison deception was being extra cautious, so the council in Edinburgh still smarting over the Bargari of the outbreak of witchcraft in Pittman. The blacksmith, Patrick Morton, was interviewed. The college council saw right through his facade, and he was sent back to Pitt and Green in disgrace. It didn't stop him filling up more trouble, though. With a mob behind him, he marched to the minister's house, telling Cooper that he now remembered that Janet Cornfoot, Janet Horsburgh, and Isabel Adams were among the demons that had tormented him. Cooper was ecstatic. And in a ranting sermon, he told his flock he'd been right all along in condemning Thomas Brown. The devil was indeed amongst them. If Edinburgh wasn't going to take action, then with God's backing, he surely would. Nobody would argue with a man who had God on his side, and the two were imprisoned alongside Beatrice Lane. 
Janet Cohen Foot confessed being guilty of witchcraft but retracts their confession when some curious nobleman and lawyers came to visit her. The minister didn't like the attention she was receiving and ordered she be giving her own room not to contaminate the other witches who had confessed. The new room had two windows, the first facing the main street and the second at back with a shallow drop to the ground. On the iciest of January nights, Janet escaped through this window. She made it on foot to Lucas some ten miles away and was barely alive when she sought refuge in the old Norman church. The minister, George Gordon, tended to her needs, fetching blankets, bread and water. In taking care of her, he found marks on their witch pricker's needle that had made. While she slept, sent his servant on horseback to Pitt and Green for the Pitt and Green witch trial for common knowledge of over Fife. The servant returned with two armed soldiers who escorted Janet back to the village and the injustice she had so courageously fought to escape. News that the witch had been captured preceded Janet's return to Pitt and Green at six o'clock in the evening. Cooper's sermons of hatred and fear and publicity surrounding the sordid event had brought a great many foreigners to the village, as well as fascinated people of all classes. It was a formidable gathering that made its way to Bailey Bell's house, where Cooper eagerly awaited Janet's return. By the time she arrived with her guards, the crowd had grown from dozens to hundreds, most of them whom stones, few stones at The accused witch. Janet tried to run for her life, but was trapped by the mob. As she was dragged by the feet down the narrow winds to the harbour, a cry went up, Give the word an ordeal! She was pulled down the stone steps, backing her face as the crowd vented their fury and hatred. The soldiers present were hopelessly outnumbered and helpless to Patrick Cooper wandered out to gloat over the rotten fruits of his labour and found to his satisfaction that Janet was tied by the waist to the mast of the Sophia, a 70-ton fishing boat stored up in the harbour. As the rope was pulled tight, a screaming wasp woman was lodged time and time again in the icy waters of the port. The crowd on the shore laughed, thoroughly enjoying their night's entertainment. It was two hours before the crowd became bored. Janet was battered and bruised with all recognition and more dead than alive than untied. She was asked to declare herself a witch but gave no satisfactory reply. With one last surge of strength, she launched herself to her attacker in a futile bid to escape. She was captured a hundred yards from the shore and the mob was angry once again. Cooper, panicking, ran to the council reporting that the mob were just about to kill Janet. If another unconvicted witch set the hide of sitting room for mentors without permission from the commissioners in Edinburgh, there would be dire consequences for the council members. An armed guard was organised and the soldiers rescued Janet, now barely alive, by pointing their weapons and dragging